That's your first time in Poland, you will play here this week. Have you heard some comments about Poland from other rappers? What do you expect about uh, Saturday's show? I've, I've never really been to Poland. Not heard too much about Poland. But we was definitely excited to come. Once they set a festival, then we know it's about something. You know what I mean? I live in Greenpoint in Brooklyn, so it's like Polish neighborhood. I mean, I don't know. I've never been here, so I mean, it's for me, it's the same thing going to any other country. You know, hip hop is big. It's worldwide. You know what I'm saying? So it's a good thing. You know, I'm glad pulling. You know, had us have us here. You know what I'm saying? That's about it for me. I mean, it's my first time here. Like I said, um. Uh, it's always, to me, it's always classic when you get all four of us at one time on the stage. It's, it's just something special, just having us four. We ain't even touched mic yet, but uh, it's gonna be crazy. Have I heard anything about Poland? Nah, not yet. But y'all gonna hear about us, though. <laughs> <laughs> and are you still digging in the craze? Do you plan to buy some vinyls here? Yeah, I do. Um, that's why I spoke to you when I came into the room. So, you know, um, I guess once we wrap up, once we finish the interview, we can get right on that. But yeah, I definitely still, I still do some digging. You, Ness? I mean, right now, I gotta... I got so much stuff I ain't used yet. I gotta, but I, you know, I'm gonna look at a few things. You know, I don't know how. How is y'all selection here? Oh yeah, I got a lot of Polish jazz and, and things like that. So yeah, I forgot. I, yeah, and that might be a good look here. Get my hands on a few things that you know. <laughs> Yeah, sleep do sound real good. You can be called the heart of New York streets because your music lives here for 20 years. And what do you think about uh, New York music today? Don't you think that there are some crises and uh, New York lost first place and South is the, uh, gaining most attention now? <coughs> yeah, well, in my personal opinion, I'm speaking for me, I agree to what you said, you know what I'm saying? The music is different. Um, a lot of New York radio stations and DJs are playing a lot of other music. And a lot of New York artists are following that type of music. But we always stay the same. Whether we're popular, mainstream, underground, it's always going to be a certain style. Sampling is going to be involved. A lot of sampling is going now. It's a lot of synth synthetic music. And a lot of people... A lot of soul is going in the music, in my opinion. But <clears throat> there's still a lot of the artists doing hip-hop. They may not be from New York, but it's all over. And if you look for it, it's still that element that you loved back then. is still there. It's just harder to find. I mean, too, if you look at the history of DITC producers, you know, Diamond, Finesse, Show, Buck, everybody's been part of big, you know, artists that, that sold a lot of records, you know, the Puns, the Fugees, Natalie Cole, Jay-Z, Fat Joe. I mean, it, the list goes on, but it's it's music that, you know, for my opinion, the digging producers didn't compromise. They, they did what they felt. If a person picked something that they did, that they wanted, you know, they, they put their touches on it and... It was a diamond produced record, or it was a finesse produced record, or a buck wild produced record. But I don't think the producers never compromised what was going on, as far as what's what's happening now. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you got all, you know, you got, you know, certain members of the crew that live in certain parts of the state, so they they actually see what's they there. You know what I'm saying? And they see what's there, and they've lived in New York, so they they got kind of a best of the both worlds. You know what I'm saying? And I think it's just the South's time. 
Everybody get their time. Midwest had their time. L.A. had their time. You know, West Coast. East Coast, I think we, um, we were spoiled to the point where we got arrogant. And, you know, we just ain't, we not doing what we supposed to do. So that's why New York, I think for me, my opinion, New York music, hip hop in general is, is where it's at right now because I think we didn't cherish what we had and we didn't build on what we supposed to build on. You know, that's just my opinion. Back in the days, I was living swell, see? I was riding bikes, roller skating and playing skelsies. Nowadays, things is different. Little kids be riffing, them knuckleheads won't listen. Instead of shooting tops, they shoot blocks. They point them at cops, and that's the way they get proud. When I look at the music, you know, me personally, I love music, you know, I love feel good music, music that feel good when you hear it, classics, and uh, I would basically never compromise the art form for something just because it's trendy today, and you know, when I look at Digging in the Crates, we never compromise what we loved and what we believed in, we just kept doing good music, and um and I think a lot of artists in New York now, they do compromise. But I never in a million years thought I would turn on the radio and hear uh, hip-hop in a state that is in New York where we are actually uh, emulating and copying what somebody else is doing. I mean, coming up in, in, in our lives in hip-hop, I mean, if you was caught emulating anything, you was automatically, like, eliminated from the game because you was called the biter. Now that's, like, in style a bite. It's like, you know, this record is out, you know, and a lot of people want to become rappers in New York, you know, a lot of up-and-coming young cats. So they feel if this is on the radio, getting played as much as it's getting played, uh, this, is, this is what I feel I have to do to get on. They the love and the passion that we had is is different today. Today is different. I think today a lot of artists prepare to be number two, you know. Number one is already out there. You know, so it's an artist that's out there. They might be popular and somebody trying to get on say, look, I gotta I wanna be like this dude. So you automatically putting yourself to be number two because number one is out there. The blueprint is out there of what that cat done did, and you want to do exactly like him, so you actually happy with being number two. But I mean, everybody at this table here, we all number ones here, because we we take pride in what we do as artists, you know, and producers. As far as the music, man, I think it's just. It's just kind of cliche. Everybody's trying to do the same thing. And I don't really think the DJs are giving... The DJs don't really have... Like, the DJs got, like, their arms, like, twisted. Like, you can't do nothing. Like, you can't break a record. You can't... You know, the only record they're going to break is if they got their artist signed or something like that. You, you know, it's not really... It's not like before. It's not like where you get props or putting people on to a record and everybody catches it like wildfire now it's like this is what you gotta play this is what time you gotta play it even though you heard it eight times in one hour when the mix when the DJ's got a mix guess what song you gonna hear you know it's it's, it's kinda like you're getting hypnotized I like hypnosis like, I don't know it's kinda strange man that shit is kinda stupid man. And do you see in today's rap game young cats with similar mic hunger that you had in the beginning? Yeah, I know a lot of cats that's hungry. You know what I'm saying? But it's it's a lot of hungry dudes out there. But like Blind was saying and what O just said, before it was, I wouldn't say it was easier, but it was easier to be yourself. Now there's probably a certain sound that they want to hear or they want you to sound a certain way. You know what I'm saying? And the hungry guys don't fit that. You know what I'm saying? They want to just spit. They want to do what they creatively in their brain and in their heart. And no one's accepting that right now. It's like 
It has to be familiar or sound close to what I already like. So that leaves a lot of room, I mean, a lot of people out of the, the whole situation. And then you have a lot of dudes making very similar songs. Like I was listening to the radio on the way to the airport, and I was laughing because it really seems like somebody's playing a joke. It doesn't seem like this is real music. And I'm not dissing everybody, but for the most part, it seems like it's a like a parody radio station. Like this is something we would make fun of back then, and it's actually really happening. And the catch to that is if I don't like it, I'm hating because I'm old school. Music is music. If it's whack, it's whack. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. And so they got the media in involved in it as well. Once you start rebelling on that, now you look like somebody that doesn't appreciate the music. And and now, if you look at Diamond's album, he produced his album. You look at my album, show produced the album, Finesse. In-house producers. Now you, you have like 10 different producers on one album getting a whole different sound. And you got about eight features on the album. And every artist is doing the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't rock like that. The features we have on our projects is usually us. We might have some people affiliates we rock with, but no one's creating a, a sound no more. It's just one sound for everybody to, to play. And uh, what would you call your biggest musical achievement? I don't know. I mean, probably the biggest thing I was a part of might, might have been that Fuji's album, but That wasn't like my, to me, that wasn't like the best thing I've done specifically for any artist. But as far as commercial, commercially, I would say, you know, the score album was for me, you know, commercially. Um, wow, I mean, um, let me see. As far as me personally, um, I think some of the work I did with, um, With Buster, you know, I might I might have felt, you know, musically, I I, I more or less lean lean toward that. You know, um, I had I had the most fun working with working with that dude. You know what I mean? And um, the Natalie Cole thing I did, you know, that was that was me stepping outside of my boundaries. You know, I thank her for giving me the shot. You know, so that was kind of interesting too. Just, just to be able to step out and do something other than what you're known for. You know, I appreciated that. That's dope. For me, it would be Soul Clap, and I'm not talking about commercial success or anything. But for me, it's just the biggest song. You know what I mean? We sold it out of a car, a chunk of a car. We got on from that record. A year later, we put the record back out with a video. You know what I'm saying? It took me around the world. You know what I'm saying? So, Diamonds was there in the studio. We did, you know what I mean? Part of making that record is special to me. You know what I'm saying? We used to spend over, sleep overnight trying to get this done. And it was one of the first records I ever recorded with Show. And it took us a far place, got us notoriety, tours. And a, 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 actually, it got us a record deal. And uh, once we got the record deal, it actually made our record special. So f it lasted so long, this song, that it, it has to be the biggest song to me and most special. And most people know me by it now. I mean, um, my biggest achievement is just having the privilege to make a record, period. Uh, and, and seeing the world, you know, touring. It's nothing for me specific, you know what I'm saying? Um, and being part of a crew with with legendary status without being like we ain't making a hundred thousand albums a month a year, you know what I'm saying? Like it took everybody as individuals one album on their own to like set set this in stone, like. Diamond's album, first album, second album, made it a legacy for him. Showing A's first and second albums made it a legacy for them. Finesse's first and second album made it a legacy. Mine's also, and like, like A said, we did it with our own producers. We didn't have 100 people on the album. So I think just, just making a record, man, forget all the money, 
to get all the, you know, a lot of people are doing it now, but not many people can make music. You know what I'm saying? I think we make music. We we just not making records. We make music. Um, my greatest accomplishment. I mean, basically, I mean, most would argue and say the Dr. Dre, the message joint. I would debate that. I think my greatest accomplishment is working with probably arguably, arguably the, uh, two of the best artists ever and Notorious Big and Big L because um, both of them happened, happened uh, spontaneously. It wasn't, it wasn't planned. It happened. I met one dude at autograph signing. And and took him under my wing, and he ran with me, and became one of the greatest dudes to ever touch a mic. And the second one is like I was working under Puff at the time, and I wanted to do like the Mary J. Blige remixes and all that, and you know all the uptown stuff. And uh, I got to work with some chubby kid from Brooklyn, you know, funny, charismatic dude, a lot of personality, and and. He he might be one of the, the greatest ever to touch a mic. So between the two, my greatest accomplishment is, is working with both Notorious Big and Big Al because they remind me of each other. You know, the hunger, passion they got for the music. And both of them is tremendously funny dudes. Both of them. You know, I look forward to working with in the studio all the time. I don't know, I think, I don't really think I've reached that plateau of a big accomplishment. I just think uh, having, um, uh, being friends with Rock Raider really helped me tremendously. And um, there's a lot of people that I've met, like these gentlemen here, through him and, and a, 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 a whole list of people. I don't want to go through that, but I think just some, um, Raider taking me seriously and, 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 you know, seeing that I wanted to actually take this serious and not just, you know, uh, uh, BS with it. Because I think I was just taking DJing as a joke. I was like, I'm not going to be K Capri. I'm not going to be Funkmaster Flex, man. Fuck this shit. I'm just going to get a job. I got my little two jobs. I got my little benefits. And fuck all this shit. And um, he was like, nigga, you bugging. And, uh... It just it happened. He took me on the road, and then it ended up me rocking with Ness when he couldn't make it, and rocking with Pharaoh, and you know, I did a couple of commercial artists. I don't want to say no names, but you know, <laughs> but you know, that was that was a learning experience in, in itself. Uh, but I, I honestly say, if it wasn't for for Rock Raider, I'd probably still be working. You know, a, a night and a day job, and still buying records with no turntables, and just have a whole bunch of records for no reason. Well, just because I like the record, buy records. Oh, Finesse, you called Big L, uh, one of the greatest, along with Notorious. And few years ago, we, re we received an info that you will work with Primo on Big L first, uh, third solo. Real legend, legends never die. But then we read that uh, it's impossible to release it due to Big L's father. And how does it look now? Shall we expect this CD to drop? Hey yo, you better flee hops Or get your head flown three blocks LK rappers hearts pumping like deep rocks And every day I gain clout and my name sprouts Some brothers still be born just to Um, I think uh, the status stands as is, you know Like I said before in the interview You know, the things we did with Big L over the course of the career I mean, his career, our career We did it out of love and you know that's what made the music special and for us and me and Premier and whoever to get together to do the album it would be out of love but not if somebody's gonna capitalize off of it you know we looking at it as a music standpoint I love for the music somebody else is looking for it or looking at it as a paycheck you know that's like 
you know, <clears throat> God forbid, you know, when you was growing up, your father was never there for you. Never. Not one holiday, not one Christmas, not graduation, never. Your whole life, this dude never there. And then the day you pass away, and he finds out how how much you're cherished in the game, how popular you became, the legacy you left for yourself in the game, and all of a sudden your pop disappears. Oh, that's my son. I love him. Yo, you really know nothing about this kid except that the fact that everybody love him. You don't really know why everybody love him because you was never into his music like that. You was never into him like that. So now you see an opportunity to make money and become popular at the same time because you know you're you're allegedly the father of this uh, legendary artist which is Big L and now it's like anything we do he will benefit you know no matter how you look at it no you should do this you should do that he's gonna benefit you know if we we drop anything with Big L any type of money that's raised from that he's gonna benefit you know and for us it's keeping L legacy alive but at the end of the day I don't want to feel like I'm being pimp by some dude that's just there and that's what I feel is gonna happen especially if me and Premier and other people get involved yeah the music will stay alive but everything it's like Big L ain't had no children so it ain't going to his children it's all going towards this dude that really didn't give a fuck about him and for me it's personal that you know I would love to do it but if you could find a way where it you know it can help out you know then it would be cool but you know I hear people on the blog say well maybe I should do it for free and just throw it out there that's stupid you know because you know throwing it out I think that's what's making the music industry decline as what it is right now. It's because a lot of artists can't appreciate the hunger and the pain of putting something out. Like if, you know, you coming up and you do it. We did records where we was paying 30, 40, 50 an hour. You know, we seven to eight hour sessions of our own money to do this music thing. You know, struggling, putting demos together, going knocking on doors, doing whatever we had to do to do this music thing. You know, so when you finally make it, a burden's lifted off of your shoulder, but you can understand the struggle that you went through to make this music. So your success is not by mistake. And anytime you think about, you know, quitting, and anytime you think about it's over or getting a regular job, all you got to think about is that struggle that it took you to make that record or make it in the game. And I think nowadays a lot of artists don't understand that struggle, that pain, because everything comes to them is free. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to rhyme off of this dude beat and put it on a mixtape. I'm going to do this and put it on a mixtape. Uh, yo. Give me a beat. I'm going to put it on a mixtape. And you're not paying for nothing. Therefore, it's no pain if it doesn't succeed because you ain't invest nothing in it. You know, but any artist that really invest, if this stay life and you love what you do, you can't see yourself just giving away that, that pain and that struggle for free. You know, and I think when, when people give it away, it's because they don't appreciate it. Because you ain't see the greatest artists drawing paintings like that and just giving it away. You know, and that's how I look at it. So when people look at the internet, the internet helps. The internet is, is hurting because everybody feel everything is supposed to be free now. And if everything is free, how is the art form going to survive? 
you know, everybody look at it, well, it's free, it's free, it's free, or you cutting each other throat to get in this music game until you finally become successful and somebody's cutting your throat because they want to get on. And the music game became, it's just like a cutthroat business. Everybody's doing whatever they feel they got to do to get on. And I think the media doesn't focus on the skill of a producer, of a rapper, you know. I mean, even when you look at the women in the game, how many actual women artists we have in the game nowadays? I mean, it's just like any chick could just be in the game now. You know, if you look pretty and got a nice body, you know, and a, and you some rapper's girlfriend, you get more attention than, than 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 female artists. But when you take everything away, it's like, well, what does this woman got to give to the game? It's nothing. I mean, the game is suffering. You know, I done took this big L subject somewhere to a whole nother level, but I think we have to appreciate the music. And when you appreciate the music and and I think it'll it'll all change, but you gotta appreciate it. It can't all this free stuff, free, free, free. Everything can't be free. You know, I don't believe in that shit. I don't believe in nothing for free. You know, something. You gotta pay something. Show me, show me something. Because I look at it like even if I find demos that came out in ninety two, they worth so much. Because people want that. They want that sound. They want to know what was created that was never let loose in 92. And that has a price on it. You know, I wish I would just give it away, you know. I mean, it doesn't make no sense. I mean, talk to me if I'm wrong, you know. Check it out, yo. AG is living fat and the men too. In other words, can I get a soul clap? Digging in the crates for something smooth. Showbiz and AG, your money, we made the party groove. And I'm a top notch competitor, carrying dough like a treasurer. Hitting skins, oh, that's regular. But the sex I never take. Cause if honey speaks great, like Mike Tyson, I'm upstate. And you know that's a fact, black. So when she says no, that means no. And that's that, no matter how cute or how desperate. Hey, yo, she gotta get the boo. Yeah, she gotta see that exit, but I'm not mad at Okay, AG, you started promoting yourself with show by, by strictly underground ways, selling your tapes out of the trunk, and you re received contract without other people's help. And how could you compare it to today's situation with internet promotion, internet underground? Uh, could you compare this situation to your situation as a rookie? Well, when we, what we were doing, it wasn't done really before in our environment. So we didn't see, we didn't have a blueprint to follow. It was just in our heart. You know what I'm saying? This is what we wanted to do. We sat down with a couple of labels. We didn't like the whole courting thing. You know what I mean? You got to wait for them to call you to let you know if they like your music or not. A person like me would wait by the phone like did they call did they call you know that gets redundant that takes a lot of, out of you because especially when you're first starting so we pressed it up ourselves and just drove around at first giving it out then we would leave it in stores on consignment for free and if you sell it then you give us our percentage and you know strangely just the songs were picking up and I would say back to what Blind was saying Kid Capri broke the record. He would play it when no one knew what the record was. And he had a great following. People respected his musical ear. So even if I didn't hear, I remember hearing Jesse West. I never knew who he was. But since Kid Capri played him, it made me listen to him a little bit more. I eventually really liked him. You know what I mean? So certain DJs like Capri are uh, missed as well. But anyway, uh, he broke the record in the castle. He had slot on the radio. He would play it. The record would get bigger, everybody liked the record. We signed with Payday Records, who actually Patrick Moxie was DJ Premier's manager at the time. Um, I met Premier through Finesse. Um, all of that was part of that whole process, meeting Finesse, being in the studio with Premier and going home and seeing his video 
on a TV. You know what I'm saying? Like, it was big for me, you know, being around these dudes. When Finesse took me to the, to the New Music Seminar, that probably changed my whole outlook on hip hop. I actually met the people that I idolized and, and would see on TV. So putting the record out ourselves, it was like either we're going to keep doing these interviews, uh, trying to get a deal, and do nothing, or we could just try it ourselves and see where it goes. And a year later, we were signed to a label, and we still actually put the record out like it was the first time. You know what I mean? So that, w that was definitely big for us. There was no internet. There wasn't no other way to sell this record but from our hands. And I take that big because right now, you don't even have to leave your house to sell a record or meet someone or anything. We had to actually use our hands, our feet, just me and him, with boxes of records trying to make something happen. But it started getting, we started getting calls from Connecticut and California for the record, and it started getting a little too big for us. So that's why we eventually signed the record deal. Diamond, last year on your MySpace, we saw a photo with Beat Rock titled LP on the Way. How does it look with it? Uh, do you work on this CD? And if yes, uh, who will rap and who will produce on it? The project that me and Pete are going to do, um, he's going to produce half and I'm going to produce half. And we're going to both rhyme, you like know. Jay hmm? Like Jay Lee. <laughs> right. It'd be like that, you know. We, we, we both going to spit on all the tracks. And uh, I don't know, we, we probably... I'll be all right. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be but all right. We probably start, like, the end of the year, we're probably starting that project. You know, we... um. Last time we got together, we, we played a couple of beats for each other that, that, that we both liked a lot. So I think just as soon as as soon as I finish up with this with this project that I'm doing, I think Pete he's doing um um the Smith and Weston album. Then I think after that we, we're gonna start on that project. So yeah, I'm kind of excited about that. OC, 2005 was your year because of releasing two fantastic CDs, Star Child and Smoke and Mirrors. And then we heard an info that you will release uh, My Soul to Keep in 2007, but since today we didn't get it. How does it look with it? Uh, do you work on this solo? Actually, um, nah, that's never coming out. You know, different titles now, different ideas, but um, you know, we did, me and A did an album after that called Oasis. And it's a little harder doing a solo album now, man. Like, you know, with uh Well put it like this, it's easier for me. My you might call it lazy now, but it's easier for me to write with a partner. You know, write with other members than to just constant your to, to 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 put your your soul into a solo album takes a lot. You gotta do the writing, you gotta, you know, pick the beats. Then you might get with finesse, you might not like the beat, or he might not like the rhyme. And, you know, it's a producer artist thing, so you gotta compromise with your dudes. And it's, it's just a lot that you gotta put into to doing a solo album. And, and that's why you gotta respect people who produce and they rhyme, because. You got two jobs when you both produce and an MC, but to be an MC and just sit there and think about ideas, that's like moving mountains, man. You know, it's, it's not the same as 94 as opposed to 10 years later. You know, I gotta feel it. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not doing no more albums solo wise, like at the moment. I'm looking just to just, you know, get that fire back. I don't know how, I don't know which way, but right now I'm not doing no more records for, for OC, like, until I somehow get inspired, you know what I'm saying? I mean, if we're going to do an album together, that's cool, but solo-wise, nah. And I heard a lot of interesting stories about releasing Starchild. At first it was released only in Japan without your agreement, then in Europe in a limited amount, 
and it it isn't available in USA till today. Is it true? And if yes, why? Everything you just said, you answered. Like the album, it's one of those co albums. It's like it's like the uh, the Grindhouse movies. You know what I'm saying? Like you'll never get that green and, and style of movie unless you get what's the dude name. Quentin Tarantino, like, unless you get a, a, a director like Quentin Tarantino and with that album, for me it wasn't done, it wasn't done, it wasn't ready, you know, um, it wasn't mixed right, and it, it kind of sounds like I'm talking about world life, because world life I didn't like a lot of stuff on the album, but... It, you know, people loved it, and I think records like that work in my favor. If I don't like it, that means I got some. I got to start thinking like that. If I don't like the record, that means I have something. Star Child, I definitely didn't like the record, but people picked up on it. It, it was weird to me, like damn, like. And then people wanted the record, and I was like, so I really had to basically go against Homeboy and bootleg the record myself. I had to like manufacture and and duplicate the record myself just to you know basically you know make money off the record and service the record to people, but. That's my formula for now. You just gave me an idea. If I don't like the records, that means I'm on this song. Diamond, you started as a producer and then you became the best producer on the mic and on your last album you rapped on other people people's beats. And do you feel more rapper or producer now? Both. I like doing both. Um If I had to pick one or the other, I'd, I'd probably pick being a producer. I, I like I like creating something out of nothing, you know, more or less. So, you know what I mean, like, I mean, like right now, I'm, I'm I'm back in producer mode right now. So that's that's always been my problem going going back and forth. I never really never really focused on my MC career um, as strong as I should have, you know, but. The other side of the coin is, you know, I'm just blessed to be able to move back and forth. But I mean, right now, presently, uh, I'm, 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 I'm back in a producer mode right now, so that's where I'm at. But I like doing both. One, two, three, four, get it! Uh, 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 2003, Law Finesse. I used to coach the team, see I'm better on the mic, find an ace up my sleeve, never on the dice, pushing a 2002 if he shot was there, sitting on 110 if he counting the spare, see ya, out your mind trying to face the guard, your rhyme is like an empty prison, a waste of bars, no time flat, see I scrape the squad, we don't ask for shit, we just take what's off, got the skills of the Finesse, you were known as one of the best street freestylers at the end of 80s and in the early 90s, and do you think that freestyle is important for a young MC? And how much did it help you to evolve as a rapper? Well, let me come off. Oh, you must not have known they battled. These two right here, they battled. You know that? AG and Lord Finesse battled. So, for people who don't know, like, these dudes, him, AG, Finesse, and L, I wouldn't even went up against them. Just to put it on record. Um, I think uh, freestyling, the art of freestyling, the art of emceeing. <laughs> the the art of emceeing. I think it it helps you. It helps you as a performer. Because I, I mean, me writing rhymes was always to get attention. Me writing rhymes was always to, 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 to captivate your attention, to hold you hostage, to hold you for every word and every line that I'm saying. You, you listening to hear what's gonna happen next. Okay, he made these two words rhyme. What are you going? Oh, how he made that rhyme? Oh, and that's a punchline too. I mean, I, I. 
I mean, that's what I molded myself after after doing. But um, freestyle, it helps you because it helps your wittiness. It helps your wittiness of writing rhymes, you know. And that, that you know, that formulates into songs, you know. So freestyling, also when you perform, you know, with or without music or with or without a hit record, you're able to really still tear down a show, you know. That's that's very important because now when you look at a lot of people and they perform, what's corny about the shows is they don't give you nothing to look forward to in the future because I'm just going to do the record you know and the record you hear on the radio and that's the end of the show. Good night. Bye-bye. You know. When you freestyle, it gives people something to look forward to. Like, is that going to be a song? Where is that from? Yo, did you hear what he said? How he said it? Yo, that's crazy. It gives your fans something to look forward to. That's what I like about freestyling. And I used to look at, um, like, Kane. I was a Kane fan. So I used to always look... Look forward to the part of the show when he's going to kick rhymes and do stuff that I never heard or seen before, because it it gives you it gives you a little light at the end of the tunnel. Well, is this going to be a record? What is that rhyme for? And at the same time, when you freestyling, it could be current events. It could be something that's currently on your mind. It could be subliminal things in the record. It, it, it's all types of things you could get from freestyling. Let me ask you a question. Do they know DITC out here? Ah. Do they know us? Do they know DITC? Do they know DITC music? Yeah, I'm You sure? Yeah. All right, put the camera on him. <laughs> he might be the only guy that know how to join up. <laughs> Unofficial member of DITC. I have a lot of fans here. For real? Yeah. There are a lot of OC fans, Finesse fans, and all of the ADC. And Big L, of course. Big L is L has, has a lot of fans. So it's a big fan. yeah. festival is, is always big out Yeah. Cool. Hey, yo. This guy raps like his parents jerking. He sounds like Eric Sermon, the generic version. This whole crowd looks suspicious. It's all dudes in here. AJ, did did you see Eight Mile Movie? And if yes, how did you feel when you heard next next uh, level beat on it first time? The first thing I thought was where's the money, but then they took care of that. But they did that on their own. They never asked for permission or anything, but they took care of it. And every time I watch it. It's dope to me because I have little nieces and nephews that don't even think I know Eminem. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's more of a, for the other people that know me more than myself. You know what I mean? So people to hear it and go, that's you? That's your record? And to hear Eminem rhyming over it, you know, the movie got an Oscar, the soundtrack. It's dope. You know what I'm saying? So I'm very appreciative of that. And especially when them ASCAP checks come in, it's always a good look. Because Eight Mile is still all being played all over, so it's dope for me. You know what I'm saying? It's real dope. And I I think it's dope that um, Eminem shouted that he's a mixture of Pac, Biggie, and Big L. You know what I mean? That made me really feel him after a while on that note. And lyrically, he's very dope. So it was dope to be associated with someone who's probably the most known guy in our country as as well. You know what I'm saying? So it was definitely dope. Um, they were battling over the record, which is dope, because that's what me and my man do. So the element of hip-hop was definitely in the movie, so I was happy to be associated with that. Okay, OC, when we talk with friends about the best OC album, we can never agree. It's like, Joel's, no, we're live, no, Starchild, Starchild. And what's your favorite album? My favorite OC? My album, uh, Word Life. Word Life. I mean, it was raw, it was uncut. You know, I would, like I said, I was a kid. 
I just wanted to make a record And up to that point I just I did I put I paid my dues You know what I'm saying Like It wasn't a one year Two years It was like Four five years In the making of Trying to get a deal And Ten years Learning how to You know MC Learning how to put records together Learning how to put verses together Just learning how to rhyme You know what I'm saying And, and I paid dues You know what I'm saying So it, it didn't matter if the record sold or not Or life was just If it, were, if, if it wasn't no world life It would be no me You know what I'm saying In the music business So to me, this is just a scrimmage. I feel I'm stoned. Not cause of Bob, but where my cap cop. The more emotion I put into it, the harder I rock. Those who pose lyrical, but really ain't true, I feel. Yeah, yeah still popular. Uh, Finesse, uh, you started as a rapper freestyler, but that, then you turned more to producing. And what was the reason? And do you feel now more rapper or producer? I mean, I always had a love for music, you know. Truth, truth said, I never wanted to be a rapper. I wanted to be a DJ at first. I thought DJs was cool. They bring out the equipment. You know, they could tell you you can't come behind the ropes. You know, I thought that was cool, you know. Chicks come to the jams to see them. You know, they got people carry the crates for them. I'm like, yo, this is what I want to do. But um, I think during the time of after, like, uh, Re Return of the Funky Man, I brought I brought some equipment, you know, because I used to watch uh, show work to 1200. And um, I kind of figured that out. So that's what I wanted to do. And it was a hobby because, you know, Sat in the crib, made some beats. Then I made my little beat cassette. And then I would play the beats. Oh, this shit is dope. Yo, who did this? And, uh, yo, I did that. No, you didn't. And, you know, once they said no, you didn't, that told me I got something here. I'm fighting to get credit on my own shit right here. So, you know, from that point on, you know, I love being a producer. And to this day, I love being producer because you can you can have so much fun, you know, if people allow you to grow, you know, because uh, the the growth thing is very important because, you know, you hear music with technology, the machines. There's so many things you can do with music that we couldn't do. Um, due to limitation, whether it was the limitation of sampling time, limitation of sample quality, you know, now it's like you can do a lot of incredible shit with, with this producing thing. I mean, I don't think I've, I've reached where I want to go yet. And, you know, if people don't pigeonhole you, you know, then you, you can you can get to be creatively different. And when I say pigeonhole you, it's like as the years go on, you see things, you hear things, and you want to do things different. And if your fans allow you to grow, they might get to see you grow into something that they never expected. And it can be incredible. But if they pigeonhole you and tell you, yo, do another Funky Technician album, do another this. Do another that. Just the word another means, you know, you're not, it's duplication and you're not allowing me to grow as a person, you know. I mean, when Michael Jackson did Thriller, you ain't go back and ask him, Yo, why you ain't do another ABC? Uh, why you ain't do another Can Say Goodbye? They just let him grow, you know, and that's what I like is production. You can go as far as you want to go, you know. I ain't saying, you know, copy what's out there. But creatively within you, if you see something, you can have fun with it. Yeah. 
Mr. Diamond, your new album begins with shoutouts from Fat Joe and Crack went mainstream some time ago and as a fan I sometimes think does he still remember where he come from and are you st still close with Cartagena or not? Good question, well you know um, I seen him I seen him last month at his little album release party and you know um, he called me on stage and before he called me on stage you know he went to this big deal about you know how he wouldn't be where he is now if you know it wasn't for me and you know he's grateful and blah 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 you know he 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 went on for about five minutes so you know it felt it seemed like it was genuine to me you know what i mean so you know i guess that answers that ag in 2006 you released get dirty radio produced by for example madlib and what could you say about this uh, connection between coast is madlib really that crazy that people says that he are yeah for sure all he does is lock himself in a studio and make beats. Absolutely nothing else. Like part of people from Stone's Throw can't even get in to the studio, to the house sometimes. They just knock on the door, he won't answer it. Like he's some mad scientist guy, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, um, it was real good to let me know. Like JD as well, you know what I'm saying? Um, I got to vibe with both of them and they just made sure that it was known that they cut from the digging in the crate cloth. The first name out of their mouth is Diamond D all the time, you know what I'm saying? And then they show and, you know what I mean, whatever. But they tell you literally out their mouth, this is why we, who we are, you know what I'm saying? And that's that's dope. And it was dope to go over to the West Coast and do an album while I was staying over there and get a whole different feel. You know, I just want to grow. Like Finesse said, man, you die if you don't grow as an artist. All I want to do is grow. My last album is just Everything's Buried that just came out. It's totally different than anything I ever did. I don't care about the feedback. I don't care what you think about it. I don't care how much it sells. I just want to keep going because I'm going to be dead longer than I'm alive. And this music could keep living when I'm not here. So why compromise it now? I just want to grow and do what I want to do. That's in my heart. That makes me happy. You know what I mean? These artists, Mad Lib, J Lib is the same way. A lot of people don't know, but... A mainstream, big, probably the biggest artist in this game, I don't want to say names, was trying to get like six, seven tracks for their new album when JD was very sick. And he put those songs aside to do the record with me because he said that was more important to his legacy than these songs with this artist. That's big to me, you know what I'm saying? So big ups to Mad Lib, JD, MF Doom, you know what I'm saying? They all really, you know, listen to the Digging in the Crate sound learn from it and now we're learning from them so it, this is what hip hop is about I need love like L I'm a dog like Snoop put me on the wall I swear A is the truth teach you how to roll a blunt red man style and I lace it with the chronic acts martial I'm iconic I'm about it about it like uh -huh. I put a hole in your fucking head I gotta be and everything's very was released this summer but before the release we didn't hear anything about the city yeah. And was it your decision not to promote it, to give fans as a surprise, or you did it so quick that, that there was no time for, promo for promotion? Actually, it was just not paying attention to the industry. I'm fed up with doing that. You know what I mean? Um, I feel like you become a robot by following. This is You can be 100% creative in this business if you want to be. And we put the record out 30 days after we finished it. No promotion, nothing. And it wasn't to sell records or to do something. It was just to have this music out and make it available. If you want to buy it, you can buy it. But what I've learned is people nowadays aren't really buying the music for the music. They're really buying the cover because they can get all this music for free anyway. You know what I mean, and that's why if you look at the cover, the cover is totally abstract and totally different. And the feedback I'm getting is, we bought it for the cover. It's very vintage. The whole album is vintage. It's really taking you back. Shout outs to Ray West. Um, one of the good moments to me is when I'm on Facebook one day and I'm typing and Diamond hits me like, yo, hey, that no she didn't join is crazy. All the write-ups I got, they killed me for that song. This is how you know like things are changing. But if I could get one compliment from Diamond, then all the interviews I do, because these dudes don't do beats. These dudes ain't in the studio. 
These dudes ain't put their life into it, so your opinion really doesn't matter to me. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be happy when you say something good about it. But when you say something bad about it, I really don't care. You know what I'm saying? So when, when coming from Diamond Show, that was the co-stamp for me. I left it with him. He hit me the next day. Yo, the album is crazy. You grew so much. And I needed to hear that from him because when we worked together, he would play me certain music because Show, to me, is the best producer ever. To me. His beat, drum patterns and the way he makes music is already synchronized in my mind because I'm used to just rhyming over his stuff. So when I hear his music, I can identify with it quickly. I really wanted to know what he would have thought about the album. And he was like, yo, you grew so much. Because he would play me certain musical joints that probably Diamond and Finesse would love. And I was like, I can't rhyme on that. Because it would be probably so different. But I've grown so much. And him listening to that album, we're actually in the studio now working on our album. And I can't wait because he's seeing my growth and what I did with this project. Now he's playing me beats that he would have never played me before. So I think y'all going to be really appreciative to what we bring out. Oh, see, few years, few years ago, you appeared on Port Authority album by Marco Polo, album that is set to resurrect the classic East Coast. And do you plan to work more with young producers like him? Yeah, man. I mean, um, part of hip hop too is is bringing in new blood, you know, new people, other people adding on to the game, and you know. Marco Polo is dope, he's from Canada and he's just one of those dudes that he's not worried about money, he's worried about just making music and having fun with it and I think he didn't realize over time that he started getting a following, you know, not worrying about what people thought so I, that's what I really like about the dude, like he's a, he's a, he's a real genuine dude so He wasn't paying attention to nothing that people were saying about his music and he was just making records and now look like he's 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 making his niche in the game you know what I'm saying like he's making his own path you know I think A worked with him I worked with him you know a lot of people did stuff for him for favors like and yeah you know what I'm saying I did it for free like it wasn't something that you just do for everybody but it was just something about him that I liked about him, his demeanor, his character, he's real humble, and uh, you know, he, we, we definitely gonna do more records together. Yeah, to add on to that, I'm on that album too with uh, Beat Nuts and uh, uh, Brand New and Sadat and Juju, but I remember we performed in Toronto, us up here, and he was right there in the front row. The show was over, he's outside chilling. You know, I mean, it wasn't like, it was like he was really appreciative to what we did and it made me feel good that dad I did something for this guy. I didn't know him at the time, but his, like Jose, the way he came across, and I, that was, that's hard. I went to Brooklyn, walked up seven flights of stairs, there was no elevator, and I'm doing this for free. And I don't even know him, but it was a vibe and it was something that, and I'm glad I did do that. Finesse, do you remember the first time when you heard Big L freestyling and did you expect that he will be such a dope MC when you heard him first time? That's the answer to that. It was yes. You know, when I first heard him, I, I, I knew, you know, hearing him at the age of 16 and him saying what he's saying at that age. You know, you project yourself to that age and try to put together what you were saying at that time. Man. Yeah, so, you know, when he rhymed for me, you know, I wasn't expecting nothing like that, you know. Uh, you know, he's trying to get my number link up with me, and I was like, whatever. You know, go ahead, Ron, let me hear what you got. Like I said, when he finished, I was getting all his numbers. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Freestyle, going to the show, you know what I mean? I'm 
Yeah. 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 No, I gave a lot of black eyes in my sporting days. Fucking with me, a lot of niggas was sporting shades. That dude, he was just way ahead of his time, and um, I used to like, oh, uh, like uh, A said, I would go get him from school. Like he would call me, I got a half a day today. What you doing? It's like, yo, nothing. And it was funny because I lived on 58th and 10th. So, you know, after 72nd Street, 50, I mean, 10th Avenue turns into Amsterdam. And his school was on 107th and Amsterdam. So I used to go straight up 10th Avenue and snatch him up. And he would hang out with me for the day. But, you know, the dude was always writing rhymes, always. I mean, even... When I told him I'm quitting, you know, I'm good, man. You you got it locked. You're going to do you. Nah, nah, nah. You got to keep it going. What, what you talking about, man? You the reason why I'm doing this, man. And, you know. So, but, you know, the dude was, he was special. I mean, we, we say it all the time how special he is. But um, I don't think he's going to be any more special to y'all than he is to us due to the fact is, you know, we personally know him was always around him. Y'all know him as Big L, the rapper, the legend, Harlem's final. We know him as the comedian, the troublemaker, the instigator. That That's the, the, the instigator, you know, because it's like no matter where we hung out, he got a kick out of getting under your skin. He might have been right here asking you some questions. Yeah, he. Funny, having you feel more fun. Yeah, he, he. We call him the instigator because, it, no matter what we doing, he's gonna find a way to get up under your skin. And the more he get up under your skin, the more he like. If you start getting mad, he's gonna keep going with it. You know, he just got a little sick sense of humor, and we love that about him because you know, when we go to a session to hang out. We know he gonna be there, and if he's there, you know, it's gonna be funny. It's just, you wondering whose skin he gonna get up under the day, you yeah, know? And you see him joking all the time, you know what I mean? It's always fly, his bars is always on point. And on stage, he's very, his shit is very much together. But I had to, we had to room together one time in Germany, and I really got to appreciate what he puts into it. I really got to appreciate what he puts into it. I saw him rehearse a song for like three hours. One song. You know, we going over. Nah, I'm chilling. I'm good. But he don't do it in front of people. That's his style. Like, he'll make you think he just remembered this shit out the blue. But he really put a lot into what he was doing. But he just didn't show you. It just seems effortlessly to him uneasy. But he definitely worked hard at it. And that's made me really appreciate even more. Because he has a style, a personality that he, he looks like he don't care about nothing. He just chill, slow motion. But he was definitely passionate about this. I remember when he played me Bonix for the first time. And if you remember the time, he didn't make a record in a while. And I seen him at a, in Harlem. And he had him. He was looking fly, presidential watch, all of this. He was looking crazy. And he's just funny. He was like, yo, man, this is the one. And I went to my, my cousin's car and played it. And I'm like, he was working on that record for like two years, just putting the slang together. And now I finally get to hear the finished product and the beat. You know, nobody in Digging had did the beat. And this is like him. He was one of the first to go outside of Digging and start getting, you know, other producers or whatever. And I was like, yo, this is kind of hot right here. You know what I'm saying? And on the other side, I think, was Flamboyant. Size him up. Size him up. Yeah, size him up was on the other side. And I'm like, yo, I actually like both of these. And he had the eye of the tiger. He knew what he wanted. He started his flamboyant shit. He started shouting that all day. He was grabbing up his producers. He kind of figured it out. He took a step back and figured it out. You know what I mean? Obviously, it was cut short, but he definitely, he definitely is uh, one of the greatest. 
You know what I mean? Anytime I listen to him, anytime I gain something that I can add to my shit. You know what I mean? So I, I constantly listen to him. Diamond, you had an opportunity to work with MCs like Exhibit, KRS, Fugees, Outcast, Rec One. Do you remember some funny studios uh, stories with them? Uh, two. It's a lot. Um, <laughs> I don't even know offhand. Um, I can't really think of one now. I can't really think of one now. But you know, I I, I basically have fun in all of them. You know, but if it's just one incident that really stands out, I, I can't really think of one right now. You better see Mary Blige and get the 411 money I rock rappers frequently, I'm like Stevie Wonder I can't see a brother beating me Wanna throw joints and get spanked, fella Wanna talk dough, I'm seeing more cash in a bank teller Wanna talk girls, you can't follow this I've been through more skins than the average dermatologist Finesse, in hip to the game you rap, rap ain't shit if it ain't real, kid And I always thought that being true and sincere is the most important thing in hip hop But then we had all all those all those things with Rick Ross when first he rapped about hustling and uh, that pa Pablo Noriega owes him hundred favors and then that he was a prison officer and after all those he didn't lose popularity he still sells the same amount of CDs as earlier and what do you think about it? That's what tells you. <laughs> That's what tells you what this generation is about, you know, because if that was our generation, they wouldn't let us slide with that shit. You know, it's one thing. It's one thing to to to, to animate your rhymes and to stretch the truth and and have fun with it. You know, everybody do that. But, you know, the whole hustling and then CO thing, that was that kind of threw me off because You know, he's adamantly denying it. Never. I never was a CEO. I never this. I was never that. I don't know what y'all talking about. And as time kept going on, the information kept coming out. You know, he really was a CEO, you know. And you go, you know, nah, nah. Next thing you know, he got an H uh, with a BT special. Now he wanna come, come clean with... Yeah, I was a CEO, and, you know, to me, it destroyed this credibility, you know, because you should have just kept it just gully from the, from the gate. If you was a CEO, I mean, a CO, I mean, minus the E, you know, if you was a CEO and that was your life, then that's your life. Things change. You might have just said, I ain't going to be a CEO no more. I'm going to hustle. I'm going to get this money. I met a connect in jail. Whatever you wanted to come up with, you know, he could have did that, you know. But when, you know, all of a sudden the truth comes out, and you know, you got hip-hop fans that say he's a phony. And then you got, uh, you know, fans that just say, yo, he makes good music, though. And I, I just, I ain't understand it, you know, personally. Still don't understand it because... He really got beat up for that shit. <laughs> it would have been over. It would have been over, like, you know. Nah, I'm the toughest dude. And then somebody put out a, a, a photograph, you know. You know, I'm telling people I was the roughest. I used to beat people up, yo, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going on and on. And then somebody find a find a picture with me in a pink outfit or something. You know, it, it takes away from the credibility. And as an artist, I'm knowing nowadays with this generation, it's more about credibility, image, and swag than it is music. If you think of some of the biggest artists out now, how much... How much is it music and lyrics, and how much of it is perception, way a person look, 
what a person got, you know, how much money you think he got, who he fucking, you know. A lot of things to do with music now doesn't have anything to do with music, you know, and I learned that. I think I learned that more. What what basically taught me that people really have to like you as a person to buy your music was Fat Joe Lean's Lean Back. That taught me because that record was like the biggest record across America. Everybody is playing it, but the sales aren't matching how it's getting played. It's getting played in radio, it's getting played in basketball arenas is getting played in baseball stadiums you know and at the end of the day i don't think that record went gold you know i really don't think the record went gold that's crazy though yo i i actually like homeboy rick ross but up to that point, it was like, damn, man, why, why didn't you just admit it? You know what I'm saying? Like, I ne- I like the new record. I like the music on the new record. I like what he does for him. He some beats, right? Yeah. He some but beats. he, his, as as far as, you know, what, what you, you asked about and what Ness said is his authenticity went down a notch for me. Because it was like, I... Like you got caught Like you can't even lie Yo internet got everything Like It's no way you can escape that It's, it's public record Yeah You know and Yo Dude had Dude got hot records But Come on B It's no way Like nobody's gonna Matter of fact It was other CEOs Who gave the information on him Oh you ain't a brother now you ain't a fellow CEO. I just remember seeing that one picture with the, you know, the white shirt, the tie, and the afro. And he had the certificate or something like yeah. that, like you know. But, but he ain't no there, man. Like I'm not mad at him. I'm not mad at him. It's just why you, you know, just keep it, keep it a hundred, man. Just be honest as possibly as you can, because there's no way not to. Like people was wasn't gonna find out about that. He had to know that. You know what I'm saying? But he ain't the only one. To add on to that, like, I feel a lot what they saying. But I think a little while ago I already accepted that this is entertainment now. I'm not surprised. Guys is walking around with fake chains. Like, it's, 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 it's to a point where I won't be surprised about anything. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't care if he was a CEO or not at that point. You know what I'm saying? I was listening to the music. There's so many other artists that's fake as well. If we only listen to authentic rappers that were getting shine right now, we'd be listening to nobody. And I, that's how I feel. So you got to pick somebody. You know, the, some of the biggest rappers in this game, if you ask me, their credibility and their whole imagery is shot as well. Everybody's pulled something off that in our era, if you did that back then, you might have not gained out of that. You know what I'm saying? It's just a different time. But being that it's entertainment, any twist to the story is good. So being that he was a CEO, we thought it would ruin him. But it's a twist to a whole story. So it just adds to the story. You know what I'm saying? So I wish everybody was authentic. What you said in the record is who you were. But people have gotten very creative. You know what I'm saying? And now I believe records are emulating movies you know what i'm saying and in the movie there's a lot of fabrication in there that starts to drift into the records as well but guys like us are still making the same type of music we love it and it's no we take pride in saying real shit even if it's struggling even if it's some fucked up shit i take pride in telling you that instead of making some shit up that never happened you know what i'm saying so i like rick ross you know what i'm saying but this is entertainment it's more like wrestling right now and I'm entertained. When we have a, a big a crew full of individuals, there's normal thing that there are some conflicts in this big crew, like Terror Squad, Fat Joe and Cuban Link, like G-Unit with uh, the game. And do you remember some conflicts in the ITC? Close. Everybody knew each other before we made a record. This is not 
is not something else. The difference, I think, with us is everybody is their own person at the end of the day. Digging is not like a group that started off as a group and everybody went solo. Everybody was running their own operation before we got together. So at the end of the day, you know, when we do things and we come to disagreements, then, you know, I'll use that shit on my project or I'm quite sure A will use it on his project. It ain't no, it ain't no forcing it to fit, you know, because at the end of the day, we our own boss here, you know, so it ain't no one person that could fire us and tell us what we can do and what we can't do because from day one we've been doing doing whatever we want to do it's just you know now as a crew yeah it's more of a it's more of a um compromise on certain things but for the most part you know I, no arguments how why you know a lot of people see it a lot of non-interacting between us and them and already take that as they're not getting along and that's not true like when I said we're just our own people doing our own thing with each other but we take pride in what we do I'm not gonna wait for finesse I'm not gonna wait for dying we do what I do that doesn't mean I'm not fucking with finesse or diamond or Joe that doesn't mean that you know what I'm saying we brothers and we ain't following the leader. This one's going that way, I'm going this way, he's going that way, and he's going, but that's what makes digging. Joe, you gotta flow, Joe. You gotta, 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 gotta let him know, Joe. That's how everybody started, though. You know? And on top of that, if I do have an argument with one of these dudes and I talk to somebody and they agree with me, you might get punched in the face for agreeing with me about me. Yeah, you know, it, it, I mean, trust me, at the end of the day, man, it, and, and it's been a lot of times, it's been a few incidents where people talked about Fat Joe to me, and, and I'm like, yo, like, I, you don't like him, that's cool, keep that shit to yourself, but he's still my brother at the end of the day, like, and it's... It ain't nothing you gonna tell me right now, you know what I'm saying? And and people don't understand that. He might be the brother that you don't get along with, but he's still your brother. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's why I just let people know from when they start talking. Oh, yo, you know, be careful. Choose your words carefully. You know what I'm saying? If I have an argument with Diamond and I I, I say something to you about it, don't agree with me if you're not in my circle, cause you might get fucked up. If I argue with Finesse, you might get fucked up if I ask you, yo, you think I was wrong? And you say, yeah, Finesse was wrong. I might punch you in your face. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, it's it's just, everybody has conflicts, issues. Ain't nobody perfect, but we just never, we don't go through air and our dirty laundry out to people. That's not how we work. You know what I'm saying? If we got something amongst ourselves, we keep it there. And we try to work it out. And at the root of the whole situation is love, man. You know what I'm saying? So that don't linger and it don't last too long. You know what I'm saying? But just to clear it up, Fat Joe was on the radio yesterday in New York saying the same thing Diamond just told you. Like, you know, I wouldn't be anything without digging in the crates. You know, they helped me be who I am, la da da. So this ain't about us not getting along with Fat Joe. And if we have any gripes, it's minimal. It's, it's nothing. It's just, you know, where you was at. Other than that, you know, it's, people make it bigger than what it is. You know what I'm saying? Um, I honestly believe, and he says it a lot, I think Big L and Fat Joe had a different vision. But L stuck to his roots with that vision. Joe wanted to be this person. You know what I'm saying? And I think it was meant for him to be a commercial mainstream artist. Everything about him points in that direction. You know what I'm saying? He needed to come from this cloth to make it original in hip hop. But I was there watching him at the Apollo win. And I'm looking like, yo, this dude is really special. He's not just regular. The way he came out when he had the girls with the cane and all that. From the first time I saw him, I said, he's gonna make it. You know what I'm saying? So. I'm not mad at all if that's the route you want to go, man, at all, you know what I'm saying? And uh, there is no gripe with me and Fat Joe or any of us, you know what I'm saying? 
He wants to make a Digging in the Crates album. We don't feel right now is the time. That may be the only thing you've probably heard about or read about. Other than that, we don't have any problems. Get your socks. I watch and watch the MCs like Clorox. Skills I have good and plenty. If you want dope lyrics, but still gimmicks, give me beats. I'm going into this something that I can float, 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 float. Oh, see, in the beginning you worked a lot with Organized Confusion, and are you still close with him? Yeah, me and Farrell's, he's, he's like my, he's, he's always been like a mentor, you know what I'm saying? Um, when I moved to Queens, he lived across the street from me in Queens, and uh, he's probably one of the dudes who shaped me how to MC, you know what I'm saying? Like he helped me. Um, You know, besides listening to like G Rap, Kane, Slick Rick, Farrell to me is like extraordinary. Like he's he's on some other shit, man. Like he might be light years ahead of himself. You know what I'm saying? In terms of how he put, you know, songs and lyrics together. And um I was always just like amazed how he put records together, how he put verses together, how he put words together. And um i wanted to emulate that, like I wanted to copy that, but I didn't want to be him. But he just inspired me to always try to, you know, bring out like the best if you gonna write a rhyme. You know what I'm saying? But that's always that's like my big brother. And blind also DJs for him. Yeah. So I mean, you know, that dude right there is crazy. Just to touch on that, I produced Farrell's new single called The Shine. So, you know, if you get a chance, just check that out. The real guys associate with the real guys. The real dudes fuck with each other, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. And on the Star Child, we had a uh, young Static Selector, who is a big figure in the underground now. And uh, do you feel that you helped him to explode and uh, do his thing? Nah. Not at all. Static Selector was on his way. Like, I think that dude been grinding. He was grinding before Star Child, you know, but um, he was just on his way, like he, that that was his, his, his path, you know, to do what he's doing, you know, with the whole terminology thing, you know, the, you know, projects he done did with, with, with different artists, you know, Aeon projects with him, you know, different people, yo, yeah, and, you know, we didn't have to pay him for it, like, it was barter system, like, Real hip hop, you know what I mean? Like true to the all form type of thing. He just came in, yo, I got the beat, boom. And we looked at him, he was like, Psh. We were doing it so quick, it was really no time. We were just in a studio, right? Oh, he popped up. Listen, I got something for the album. We played it and I'm like, yo, oh, this sounds like the intro. And I went right in and I'm like, yeah, we gotta do it like this. You know what I mean? Yeah, but that kid, he's been on that path. You know what I'm saying? He's been hungry. So we, we definitely didn't help him out. I didn't help him out, but I, I'm glad I have a part in, you know, people mentioning his name with mine. You know what I'm saying? That's cool. You know what I'm saying? Any day. Yeah, we used to play manhunt and steal your bike and fight off the older dudes who try to steal your knife. Right. Don't matter if you outnumbered, steal your fight. Put a nigga in the yoke, let him feel your bite. Living in the devil's reach. Fucking girls on the roof, we call it Pebble Beach. Yeah, leave it though we were kids, we still knew right from wrong. That's the premise for me to even write this song. Diamond, when I was listening to Huge Hefner first time, I, I was thinking, why legendary producer Diamond D is rapping on other people's beats this time? Well, I mean, you know, after, after um... After always producing all of my own stuff, I just wanted to do something different. And, you know, just not... I didn't want to wear all the hats. Um, when when, uh, when Dilla was alive, he had, a, he had a deal on MCA. And... I don't really know, like, what happened behind closed doors, but I know basically MCA, they thought he was going to produce the whole record. But he had reached out to different producers. He reached out to Knotts. He reached out to me. He reached out to Pete. And he didn't want to produce the whole album. 
Music. You know, a lot of times, you know, like my whole career, I basically produced everything damn near that I did. So that last project was just me just stepping out of the box and, um, you know, just not, not wanting to wear all the hats, so to say. So that's basically, you know, what came about with that project. I, I wanted to do something like Dilla and just not produce everything. So that's why I only did like maybe like three songs in that last CD. You said that today's hip hop is worse than it was in 10 years ago and there's less dope music, but who do you listen to when it comes to new music? Do you have some young cats who you like to listen? Um, producers, I like Black Milk. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know if you would really call him new, but he's like part of the new, the new batch. Black Milk, um, Marco Polo. Um, I like Drake. I think, think he brings something fresh to the game, you know. Um, I know I'm leaving out people, but just off the top of my head, that's all I can think of right now. Um, I listen to a lot of unheard of music of younger people from my neighborhood, from wherever. When I'm traveling, guys give you a CD and all that. Um, I definitely like Black Milk. I was listening to his album. Um, I like his rhymes as well. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's dope. No, I mean, he's dope. He's dope. I, I really like him. Um, you know about Dabri? Dabri from California? He's on uh, Ghost Records or whatever. He did an EP. He got a little Jay Dilla style, but he's different. He's weird, but I really, really, really like him. It's not well that much promoted. You know what I'm saying? But I, I really like what he as a he's a producer as well. I like what he brings to the table. Um I listen to my own people's nine fifty plus of course. Um and the Beast Boys. But for the most part, you know, it's a lot of old music that I'm listening to. Refurbishing my what I like and what I used to listen to because music is a mood and certain moves can't be duplicated unless you listen to this certain type of music that puts you in that mood. The music nowadays doesn't put me in any type of mood. I don't really react to it. So when I want to get inspired, I'm constantly writing and I constantly need to be inspired. I listen to different things. Like the other day, I was just listening to all of the disc records back to back. Second round knockout, 10% this, no Vaseline. You know what I mean? I, I go through zones like that where I want to hear the people before me that were very creative and see what what I could add on that they didn't. I don't really get inspired by any of the new guys. I like Jay Electronica a lot, you know what I mean? But uh, um, I fell back a little bit since his take on New York, but other than that, I still like him, you know what I'm saying? Yo, honestly, I like the, um, I like the Kid Cuddies in them, not so much because People feel like they the the new artists, but it just brings something. It brings fun back to the game. If you if you go back to like the Daylas and the YZs and you know the 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 eclectic, the, you know what I'm saying? Like just people who not looking tough. You know what I'm saying? Like hip hop wasn't always about that for me. You know you had different you no know, parts of the game, but. It was different parts of the game. Like KRS didn't sound like Slick Rick, and Slick Rick didn't sound like Chuck D, and Chuck D didn't sound like LL, and LL didn't sound like Rakim. Right, so, you know, whether people like it or not, you need the kids in the halls, you need the J. Coles, you need the Kid Cuddies, you know, you need those, um, you need the Soldier Boys, you need all of that, you know what I'm saying? Because hip hop was a melting pot when it was coming up. No one. All this sound like the, the next, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, people ask me questions like that, and, and then when I give them answers, they look at me crazy. It's like, yo, we think you listen. I can't listen to a whole Cool G rap <laughs> session all day. I have to listen to other things. And I think they're a representation of the future, the Cuddies, the J. Coles, the Soldiers, you know, and you got to see what they do with it. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, it's, it's 
it's not enough underground that's not being heard or seen, but it's a lot out there. I mean, I have to do my homework. I have to study and see what's going on in the underground as far as lyricists because it's a lot of them out there. And and we got to support them because people supported us. You know what I'm saying? I mean, uh, musically, as far as producers, um, I listen to Knots and I listen to um, Knots and I listen to uh, Jake One. That's the music I listen to right now. <coughs> Um, it's from the production side. From the rappers, I like Joel Ortiz. And I listen to A, believe it or not. I listen to all A new shit. You know, and you know, that's what I'm inspired by right now. And I think, you know, I need things that's gonna jolt me and inspire me to do better music and, and, Lyrics or whatever have you, because I can't listen to something that I don't like and be inspired. It, it just it, it has to be something that I really feel is dope to make me go, yo, I gotta, I gotta step up. I gotta, I gotta work on something. Well, you know, that's that's my take. As far as producers, I know Ness is really trying to get me to flip the switch and take that a little bit more serious and create a different lane for myself. But I really, I like Black Milk. I like the little super group they're trying to do with Sean Price, him and Guilty Simpson. That's going to be really dope. And I, nothing for nothing, I really like M. Phases from Australia. Like, he's a problem. He's a problem. Like, that dude is like, damn, like, you really think I can make beats? And that's like, this dude is like, I don't know, whoever he's getting to come in there and play them keys, man, it's retarded. Like, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Nah, man. Nah, man. Phases, man. Phases, man. Phases. Nah, man, nah, nah, nah. Not, not a new, like the new, like the new, like the new batch is retarded. So, I will, I will, I will. Um, I like, you know what? I like dude from Atlanta. I like uh, Big Crit. I like Donnie. I like. There's a lot of people out there, man. But. What artists you like? Yeah, I prefer Big Crit, Donnie, fucking Sean Price. I like this guy. This, you, this guy, this guy's good. The AG, this AG guy, this guy's pretty good. It's it's so. Ah. Oh. I don't know, you know, Diamond got the Superman joint. That joint is hot. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a lot, it's a lot going on. I mean, I it's so many people you can name, but you know, homeboy Sandman is dope. Rugged and Rough is dope. There's so many, it's too many people to name. But too many. Donnie Goins is dope. You know, Jaded Us is dope. Dope and he's a hard worker. Yeah. 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 There's so many people. Like, I could sit here and just be like, blah, 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 blah. But it's just it's like, get playing. A lot of people yeah. Talking about, you might not even know. You might not even know. I don't know the guy. He's really great. Because I didn't know Yeah. He's definitely like him. Yeah, it's a lot of people, man. The German, I mean, I see him at a lot of um, networking functions. Gives it his always performance is really intense. I still like technique though. I'll step on your neck and stab you with an ice pick. And yeah, this is. Crazy. I like atmosphere. I like. Uh, I mean, Vinny, Vinny Paz. Vinny Paz. Vinny Paz. Vinny Paz is dope. He's he reminds me of him though. There's a lot of people, man. There's people out here, man. It's just you know the machine is like. This is what's gonna rock, and the rest of that, you know. Push to the side. Yeah, they kind of, they kind of, yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, they summed it up. But it's like Premier said, like Prince said, underground, what he said, underground is like roaches. You here forever. Yeah. Like, I still, I still it. like Royce. Royce is still a problem too, though. Royce, Royce is still a problem, man. Five nine. Everything's a problem too, man. Ball for ball. He got the MC stuff going on. He got the MC spirit, Joe no, Buck. I seen, Arrogant. I seen him live with Beanie Siegel, Styles P, Uncle Murray, some other dude, and he, he 
you just really pull the buttons and then, yeah, because they yeah. wait in the green room for 45 minutes while they're doing it. Are you talking about the green room? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Having the green room just waiting. Oh, what? Yeah, while everybody's doing it. Yeah. Yeah, this is a man. The guy is supposed to come get him. He said he go outside and smoke a cigarette. The guy's outside smoking yeah. a cigarette. He's stabbed. Don't you just... So he comes in the room by himself. Yo, I ain't come here to talk, do no interview, throw the beat on. I came here to bar and I can leave, yo. Niggas is looking at him like, yo, what's wrong with you? He's like, nah, I'm no disrespect to nobody here, but fuck niggas treating me. Yo, throw the beat on, man. I ain't here for all that other stuff, man. They threw the beat on and he really went in. They felt him. They gave him love and all that. Damn, don't get Joe mad. We in here now. Put a beat on. Don't ask me no questions. Y'all can get back to these niggas to do whatever y'all doing. I'm out. And that's it, simple. Put a beat on, don't ask me no questions. <laughs> I'm not doing no interview. <laughs> Murder note is, that's my nigga. Matter of fact, Kendall. Those, it's, it's that I have nothing to do with them two. Reggie Bay. I'm gone. I'm Listen, out. This is motherfucking that's history. Quick. I got Beanie Siegel, I got Joe Buddies, I got Freeway, I got me. Uncle Murder, Fuck. I got Styles P, and I got this. Yeah, but don't do no fucking shit. I don't come up here for this fucking shit, man. I come up here to see you. Beans, what's up, bro? Joey. I'm sorry. My name. I apologize to y'all. Get your shit off, bro. I'm old, man. Okay. Thank you. We're wrapping up. He said, Time is up. Someone else is coming in. See, you didn't know I knew that, right? You didn't know I knew this language. Okay, so thanks for a really, really, really long interview. Yeah. And would. You do really long interviews, so you like it. Yeah, yeah, we do like 15 man interviews. Shout out to that shit. Hey, you love, shout out to Boogie yeah, that shit put him in sleep for a minute. I got a And, and right. would you like to add something for your Polish fans at the end? Dzień dobry. Dzień dobry. <laughs> Yo, but nah, seriously, look out for this. Look for our album we're putting out with, uh, with Party Artie. You know what I mean? Rest in peace to my man P80. And we got a out like four albums with them, you know what I'm saying? So we're gonna start releasing those, and that's just something I wanted to bring up to the people because a lot of people uh, didn't get to really hear his genius, and he left us something. So we're gonna definitely put it together and put it out. So I just want the people to, to stay tuned to that. P80.